Amen. I hope that was a blessing to you. And I know some of you may have seen that before, but uh, if not, there is an opportunity to see a little bit about what we're about. And I would say this, you know, I'm 60, going to be 61, and I'm still trying to expand the LZ. I don't know if anybody knows what that means. That's military lingo. When you go ahead and land with the choppers, you get your landing zone as big as you can get it, lest it collapses on you. So you don't just huddle up around the chopper. You go and expand your influence immediately. There will come a point at which the LZ stops expanding. Amen? And at that point, you're going to hold the line, and sometimes it tries to work its way back. The larger the landing zone, the better off you are. And so at 60, my energies are slowly dissipating, but I can tell you we're still expanding the LZ. And you pray for us so we make an impact across America because, believe me, this is a nation that honors God with her lips, but her heart is still far, far from her. And so you pray for us. We want to make a difference. By the way, I would have to say this. Most of you that I talked to were more concerned about where the Corvette was than, than where I had been, all right? I just want you to know that. I heard that so much yesterday. Hey, where's that Corvette? Do you still have it? I said, you know, um, you know I'm doing all right, too. But, yeah, it's good. But where's that car, you know? Now, the car is on permanent display. We actually donated the car last year to a museum in Allentown, Pennsylvania called America on Wheels. It's a 52,000-square-foot museum on the history of transportation in America. It's an hour and a half from Ground Zero, one direction, and a little over an hour and a half from Shanksville, where Flight 93 splashed down on the other direction. We had a huge, huge event. Our newsletter features that, so if you still didn't get a newsletter and you want one, see my wife and grab one. But it was a wonderful day, 20th anniversary, last year on a Saturday, probably the biggest event that museum has ever hosted, and we donated the car to that museum. Now understand, it's just not an ooh and ah item. It was put together with intent and purpose. And so with the car came a looping four-minute production that goes ahead and lets people know what the car is all about, and it also has subtitles. And then there's a stainless steel pedestal with a story of the roses, the roses all over that car from a personal visit. Somebody identified someone they knew that perished, either 9-11 or overseas in the war against terror. And then a QR code that you can take your phone, and it pops you to get the gospel and shows you how to pass final inspection. So the car is every day now, with the exception of Sunday, operating as a burning bush. People turn aside to see what that thing's all about, and they get to hear from God. So it's actively impacting individuals every day up in that museum. All right, so if you want more details there, and do see my wife if you want to get one of her two books. She is an author. These things have struck a chord and met a need. I think we're almost getting to a thousand of these in the last two years that have been purchased. They've really met a need. I, I'll tell you this, I edited these books. And I came under conviction editing these books my wife wrote. It is gritty and gracious stuff. Ladies, it's a blessing. So if you want one or a newsletter, you see my wife. She's in charge of all that, all right? Take your Bibles. Let's go to First Peter, or excuse me. Let's go to the book of James, chapter 1. James, chapter 1. Boy, that's always a tough start. The guy doesn't even know where he's heading in his sermon, amen? James, chapter 1. And if you need a handout, slip your hand up real quick. I know some of you slipped in after Deb had gotten some of these out. If you need a pen or a handout, I will say this handout you will use for a long, long time. This message tonight, very helpful. And it was interesting to me as I came into the uh, church house, your pastor and I were sitting and talking, and, and uh, he said to me, he said, I've been working my way through the book of James. And I said, isn't that something? 30 days ago, a month ago, the Spirit of God tapped my heart about preaching some messages out of the book of James to you as a church family. And uh, I, I, whereas maybe some would say, well, he's already got it covered. I can tell you this much. It is a very, very in-depth book. And I will guarantee you, as good as your pastor is, there'll be some things you already forgot. There'll be some things you didn't hear. There'll be some things that you need to hear again. And so tonight's message, I believe, is one of them that'll be a help to your heart. James chapter 1, I'll let you remain seated. Look with me in verse number 1. 
The Bible says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Notice who this book is written to. He says the next two words, my brethren. This book is very clearly to the saved. You say, well, that's me, preacher, I'm saved. Well, then this is to you tonight, because he's talking to those who are saved, brothers and sisters in the Lord. He says, my brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that she may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. The book of James is an interesting book, and James actually deals with authentic Christianity. James doesn't focus as, uh, uh, on, on as much orthodoxy, which is the organized thoughts of what you believe, as he focuses on orthopraxy, which is how you live. And may I say tonight, how you live is what you really do believe. Amen? Amen. That is the ultimate indicator of what you truly believe. I said it yesterday, the heart versus the head. The mind may agree with things, but the heart, that rudder, is what steers you. And James deals with orthopraxy, focuses on how you, on how you and I live. He deals with authentic Christianity. And the central theme all throughout the book of James is the challenge to grow up. Six times the word perfect is used in the book of James, and it has the idea of being mature, being complete, being grown up. In the very first area, isn't it interesting, scattered Christians that are being persecuted for their faith, the very first area the Spirit of God challenges them to grow up in is in their attitude towards trials and tribulation. In their attitude towards trials and tribulation. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you tonight for the privilege we have again to be in your house and with your people. And Lord, I pray tonight that you would take your word and you'd press it upon our hearts. Help us as we sang earlier. Help us, Lord, to say yes in whatever area you challenge us in. And Lord, we pray that we would grow up even in this area, this attitude towards trials and tribulation. And we ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Grow up in your attitude toward trials and tribulations. You know, <clears throat> I think it would be good as we just look at this thought to just consider a couple of things about growth. Because the central theme throughout the book of James is a challenge to grow up now that you're saved. Let me say this about growth, not only from the Word of God, but just practical experience and observation. First of all, growth is to be expected. Growth is to be expected. Could I get an amen there? And when you get born again, it's an expectation you ought to grow. That should be a default setting automatically. Number two, growth is normal in living things. If something's alive it automatically wants to grow. Amen? All right? Your kids, when they were born and they were alive, guess what? They automatically started growing. That's a very, that's a very normal thing. Growth is not abnormal. Growth is very normal. But thirdly, not only is growth expected and growth is normal, but growth is a sign of health. Amen? If something's alive and healthy, it automatically grows. Let me say this. When you were saved, the day you were saved, you were born again. You were quickened. You were made alive through a quickening spirit. His name was Jesus Christ. And let me say this. He found you and he saved you, but he doesn't want to leave you where he found you. And he doesn't want to leave you how he found you. He wants you to grow. It should be an automatic thing in a healthy believer's life. I remember with 12 grandchildren, some of the experiences not that long ago we had. I remember one in particular. We were with one of our kids, and uh, one of our granddaughters didn't get her way. She was about three years old, and, and all of a sudden, because she didn't get what she wanted, man, she threw herself on the ground. She kicked and screamed, and down south, y'all call that pitching a fit. 
All right. I mean, just pitch to fit. And I remember being mortified by what I saw. I thought, man, that came from my that came from my family tree, man. I that's part of my downline. I'm just a, a couple of steps removed from that. And but you know, as I thought it through, I thought, really, she's only three years old. I mean, though I didn't like it, it, it kind of went with the age and the turf, you know what I mean? And so I didn't get that alarmed when I saw a three-year-old pitch a fit and do what she did. But I'm going to tell you, when she's 23, I better not see that. Y'all with me? She ought to grow out of that thing. Y amen? And I'm just going to tell you, there's some behaviors you and I had when we were newly saved. They ought, you ought to be beyond that by now. You ought to be coming more like Jesus Christ and less like you. And that's because you ought to grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Amen? It is to be expected. Your Heavenly Father expects you to grow. And if you're alive and healthy, you will grow automatically. Amen? It's a sign of health. And here we see, as, as we're looking at scattered, persecuted believers, we see the very first area the Spirit of God wants them to grow in, and it's this, in their attitude towards trials and tribulation. Let's just break this down verse by verse. Notice he says in verse 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. And notice verse 2, he says, my brethren, count it all joy. You know what the proper attitude should always be? It should always be joy. Write that down. I want to remind you tonight that joy of the Lord is your strength. Nehemiah makes that very clear. It's the joy of the Lord that's your strength, and that ought to be a default attitude for God's people is joy. You cannot always control your circumstances. Could I get an amen there? But you should always control your attitude. And here we say, see, he says count. It has the idea of determine it to be so. Don't discount it. Don't dismiss it. Count it all what? Joy. There's the proper attitude. When ye fall, isn't that interesting? It has the picture of the unexpected thing. I don't know who you are, but man, when a problem comes my way, it's so much easier to deal with it when I can see it coming. Amen? But it's that blindside thing that catches me. And, and frankly, I just put it in how it squeezes my sponge. You know what I mean? That's the one that gets me. Count it all joy when ye fall into what? Diverse temptations, which means multiplied, many, or numerous. You ever hear the, you know, you get some trials? Guess what? We've all said this. When it rains, it pours. Where did that come from? That's a Morton Salt commercial. And all that meant, because salt used to coagulate when it was high humidity, and so Morton Salt came up with the idea that if he put certain things in there, iodine, whatever, that it wouldn't coagulate. So that's why when it rains, the salt still pours. That's what that actually means. But we took it to go ahead and mean, man, when it rains, it pours. All kinds of problems. Amen? He says, my brethren... Count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations, which is tests and trials. Go to 1 Peter. I want you to see something here. Just one book following the book of James, 1 Peter. It speaks of the trial of your faith in 1 Peter. In chapter 1, Peter ought to know. And notice in 1 Peter chapter 1 what he says. Speaking of our faith being tried, the trial of our faith. In 1 Peter chapter 1, he begins in verse 3, noting exactly all that we have in Jesus Christ. His look is upward, it's heavenly. He looks at the, the lively hope and the resurrection of Christ. Verse 4, an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and reserved in heaven. And then watch in verse 5, he says, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time wherein you greatly rejoice. Now watch it. Verse 6, it comes smack dab down to earth, though now. Did you get that? All this heavenly stuff, praise the Lord, you know, all this heaven. And then though now. I know that's all up there, but he says now, here's what you're going through. For a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, which is trials. Notice verse 7, that the trial of your faith 
being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Very interesting to me here in 1 Peter that your and my trial of faith is likened unto gold. Did you catch that? Your and my faith is likened unto gold. And gold's an interesting commodity. It's getting more valuable every day that goes by as we're alchemizing our dollar and seeing inflation go. But, you know, could I ask you a serious question? And from Alaska, we got a lot of gold up in them there hills. We got a lot. That's still big. Gold mining's big in Alaska. But let me ask you a question. How do you determine the value of gold? I mean, if somebody came up to you right now and said, hey, here's some gold and just put it in your hand. How can you determine what that gold is worth, what it, its true value is worth? Any idea? What, what was that? Okay, you're going to check purity, right? You're going to check its weight, okay? I mean, you can't just look at it and go, well, that, that gold is worth, mm, you, you don't know just looking at it. You, with me? You, you know what? You only can determine the value of gold by testing it. It has to go to the assayer. And it has to be tested for content, for purity, for weight, and all of that. And only after it's run through a series of tests does the assayer then say, this is exactly the value of that gold. Let me tell you something about your faith. Your faith is no difference. Just like gold, the value of your faith, its purity, its content, its strength, will only be determined by testing it. And this life is where your and my faith gets tested continually. Amen? Amen? Write that down. You can only determine the value of gold by testing. And just like gold, your and my faith's true value and purity and strength will only be determined by testing. You need to recognize something. Take your pens out. You and I as believers, as trials come in our life, as tests come and tribulations, we need to recognize all of those come with permission from God. And when that happens, recognize this. You can never grow. I can never grow in my faith unless I get my attitude right toward the trials and the tribulation and the testings that come my way. Write this in. Recognize something tonight. This is so important. Your testing is not against you when it shows up. It's for you. Your testing is not intended to break you, but it's intended to build you. Your testing is not meant to ruin you, believer. When the Lord allows those things in, it's meant to reveal you and the strength and the purity of your faith. I remember this as a young Marine. I was newly saved, probably about two or three months old in the Lord. I was in Memphis, Tennessee at Naval Air Station Millington. And that spring, that May, they had the Navy Marine Corps track and field meet. And so I'm a bit of a gazelle. I'm a bit of a runner. And so the gunnery sergeant picked me to run as one of three of the Marines in the one mile race. And uh, you know anything about Memphis, it's pretty warm getting toward the middle to the end of May and uh, hot and humid. And so every Tuesday, every Wednesday, two, three times a week, we'd meet as a track team to go ahead and prep for this track and field meet. Marines didn't want to lose to the Navy. So this was a big deal. Navy didn't want to lose to the Marines. It, it's a big deal. And I remember thinking one mile, man, this is going to be, ah, oh, this is going to be like so easy, you know, because I was running three miles in the Marine Corps. And so what's one mile? But I'm going to tell you that gunny, I mean, I think he had a sadistic streak in him because as we would or, line up to practice and, and he'd say, all right, where are my milers? And I'd show up and it was about 90 degrees, you know, 90% humidity. All right, milers, he said, we're going out running seven miles today. <gasps> Seven miles. I remember thinking, seven miles. Man, I felt like you don't do this, but I felt like saying, Gunny, I'm only running a mile in this race against a bunch of puny sailors. <laughs> I'm looking to see who my sailors are. And uh, what's, what's, what's seven miles? I can remember that like yesterday. Huffing and puffing out there at the three and a half mile turn. 
all the heat coming up through the tunic, salt stinging your eyes, sweat coming down. And as I made that three and a half mile turn, one other guy was still with me. And I remember thinking to myself, am I glad I'm saved? Oh, oh. And then it started getting verbal. Man, I said, I'm saved. You what? I said, I ain't going to hell. I became a believer three months. Oh, he said, would you be quiet? No, are you a Christian? I mean, I'm, I'm going to redeem the time. You're feeling like it's, you're going through hell. I want him to hear it, you know. And I mean, I just witnessed to him. <laughs> he, he finally just let me run ahead of him, man. He got tired of it. But I remember thinking to myself, what is that gunny's problem? Why would he do that to me? That is so painful? Oh, but I'm going to tell you something. When the day of the race came, and all I had to do was just run one little old mile, whoo, I just peeled around that track like it was just a little walk around the block. You see, what the gunny did is he built me and he stretched me, and he trained me so that I was better than I could ever be for that moment. I'm going to tell you, your God's no different. He's going to bring things in your life to stretch you. He's going to bring things in your life to get rid of baggage that you just don't need to be running with. Y'all with me? And to purify you so you can run your race with patience, not for just any old king, but for the king of all kings. Amen? Now watch this, go back to Exodus, and notice with me a classic moment here in his children's lives. Go back to Exodus chapter 15. You and I need to recognize that growth is to be expected. God wants you to grow in your faith. He doesn't want you to stay stagnant and stay the same way you were when he found you. And growth is to be expected. Growth is normal, and growth is a sign of health and life. And one of the areas he wants us to grow up in is in our attitude towards trials and tribulations, things that don't go our way. Notice in Exodus chapter 15, interesting moment, verse number 22. Look with me, Exodus 15, verse number 22. It says, So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, Exodus 15, 22, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Boy, you can imagine how thirsty they must have been right here. Three days, no water, lips are parched, tongue is dry. They're looking for water. Now watch verse 23. And when they came to Mara, they could not drink of the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. And there he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. I can imagine the setting here, and after incredible victory, they've just come across the Red Sea in a supernatural way. Now three days in the wilderness, a trial is now on them. There's, there's no water. God's leading them, but boy... This one's hurting, you know, the lips are parched, the tongue is dry, and I'm sure they begin to pray. And this was very unexpected. I believe this was very disappointing to them. They had just been supernaturally delivered. I mean, why is God not giving them something to drink? And after three days, can you imagine the outpost say, hey, water, water, oh, the whole congregation, oh, praise the Lord. Oh, we knew he wouldn't forget us. Oh, isn't God good, you know? And then they get to it and they can't drink it. It's brackish. It's unpotable. It almost seems like cruelty. You with me? And what's their response? The Bible tells us they murmured against Moses. You go to the very next chapter in verse 8, you'll find Moses reminds them, when you murmur against me, you're actually murmuring against the Lord. Amen? So they murmur against the Lord. And yet, in the midst of all this, you and I need to recognize, look at verse 25, the answer to their need was already there. The tree was already there. It, it was already in place. Notice in verse 25, it says, And he cried unto the Lord, the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. The God had already made provision. They didn't have to murmur. They didn't have to pitch a fit. They didn't have to get upset about what was going on. The tree was already there. I wrote this down, and you might want to catch this. 
in this trial recognize something. They were not out of God's will. Amen? They're right where God led them. Number two, Moses wasn't out of God's will. He didn't miss God's call. He was right where God wanted him to be and led them right where they were supposed to be. Number three, the devil didn't make them do it. Y'all with me? That's how we are. Anything bad, that's the devil. Anything good that we deem good, that's of God. No, the devil wasn't in this deal at all. God did this whole thing. And for one reason, why? Look at verse 25. To prove them. To prove them. And guess what? They failed the test. How do you know they failed the test? Because of their response. They murmured and they complained. God did this whole thing to try their faith and to prove them. My question is, how do we pass the test when the trial comes? Go back to James chapter 1 and look with me. The Bible gives us the answer. How do we pass the test? Well, the proper attitude is joy. But notice, the proper response to the trial, write it down, is patience. It's patience. That's the proper response. The attitude is joy, but the proper response is patience. And authentic and mature Christianity recognizes the number one thing you need in the midst of a trial, write it down, it's patience. It's patience. And yet, could I ask a million dollar question? He ever heard somebody say this? Don't pray for patience. Who's ever heard that? Who's ever heard that? All right. I heard that. I, I won't ask who's ever said that because I'll probably have some hands go up. I remember early in my Christianity, Sharon Bliss, the wife of the warrant officer in the Navy, Bob Bliss, who discipled me, would always say, now, Brother Dave, don't pray for patience. Now, you need to understand something. I was raised in a very impatient home. I was raised in a very intense home. Right? We were a get or done kind of, kind of people. And, and, you know, our attitude was, say, lead, foul, or get out of the way, step aside, make it wide. You ain't going to get or die. I mean, that, we were very impatient people. Y'all with me? Could I get a witness there? Yeah. All right, okay. Somebody's going, yeah, I married one of them. Okay, yeah. <laughs> ah, yeah. Okay. So here's Sharon, the wife of the guy who's discipling. I'm just a few months old in the Lord, and she's telling me not to pray for something I wish I always had, which was patience. And I'd say, well, Miss Sharon, why shouldn't I pray for patience? And she'd take me to a Bible verse. You remember where it was? Romans 5.3. Just turn there. I want you to just look at this verse. She would take to me, me to Romans 5.3. She would quote it, and she would say, don't pray for patience, Brother Dave. Because she, and then she'd quote this verse, because the Bible says in Romans 5, 3, at the end of verse 3, because tribulation worketh patience. I'd say, okay. Well, this is what she meant. If you pray for patience, God's going to send you tribulation because tribulation worketh patience. Amen? All right? But I want to ask a couple questions. How many of you in the last 30 days fervently in your prayer closet beg God to give you patience? And some of you may have, but I'm asking a serious question. Lord, please give me patience. I need more patience. How many of you actually asked him for it? Just raise your hand. All right. Amen. Okay. <laughs> oh, I got a great family conference too. Anyhow, no, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Okay. But notice very few of us do. You didn't pray for it specifically. But how many of you in the last 30 days in spite of the fact you didn't ask God for patience, still had trials, still had tribulation, still had problems come in your life. Raise your hand. It still happened. Huh? Okay? All right, so see, what I've learned, whether you pray for patience or not, the tribulation and the trials and the problems are still going to come. There's no shortage of trials and tribulation and problem in this sin-cursed earth. You know what the shortage is? Patience to respond to them. So whether you pray for patience or not, you're getting the tribulation and the trials. Because Jesus said in John 16, 33, in this world, ye shall have tribulation. Amen? 
Whether you pray for it or not, you're going to get it. And so I say to you, pray for patience. Beg God for patience. Get in your prayer closet and ask Him. And you say, why? Go to Romans and watch this in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, we're on the second, the back half if you're taking notes. In Romans chapter 12, I want you to notice something. I say you and I should pray for patience. Romans 12, look at what's said in verse, verse 10 through 12. Romans 12 says this. He's talking to believers. The you is understood. You should be what? Romans 12, verse 10. You should be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. You should be honoring each other and preferring one another. Verse 11, you should not be slothful in business. You should be fervent in spirit. You should serve the Lord. You should rejoice in hope. And look at this, 12, you should be believers patient in tribulation. Why? Why should you and I, when the trial comes, pause and ask God for strength beyond ourself and ask Him for patience. Why? Two reasons. Number one, patience allows you to reflect the glory of God. Write that down. Patience allows you to reflect the glory of God. Look in Philippians chapter 2. Look at what the Bible says about this. Galatians 2, or Philippians 2, look at what he says in Philippians 2 and verse number 14. We are to be patient in tribulation. And there's two reasons why. Number one, because, because patience allows you to reflect the glory of God to those who are around you. Look at what's said in Philippians 2 and verse 14. He's talking to believers, and listen to what he says. He says, do how many things without murmurings and disputings? What's the word? All. all. He says, do all things without murmurings, that's the complaining spirit, the down in the mouth, and disputings, the, the contention. Why? That she may be blameless and harmless. Look at this. Look at this setting. The sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Let me tell you something about this old world. This old sin nature, this old world, it's an impatient place. Amen? You get out in traffic, you know exactly what I'm talking about. People want to get there now. We're the crowd that stands in front of the microwave and screams at it to hurry up. Y'all with me? That's an American. That's how Americans do stuff. We're impatient people. We want it now. And we get angry if it isn't now. And it isn't served on time. And you know, there's something about a trial when it comes in someone's life. And they do not respond or react like the world does. They respond like Jesus Christ would have. Amen. You know something I found? Spiritual people take a big thing and make it smaller. Shh. Unspiritual people take a little thing and make it bigger. Amen? Oh, yeah. You know what this world will do? They'll take little things and through drama and pride and contention, they'll blow that thing up so big. You go, what in the, how did, what did we, how did we get there? You know what I'm saying? Now I'm going to tell you something. The first thing patience will do, it'll allow you to bring glory to God in this impatient, wicked old world. Could I get an amen there? Y'all with me? Absolutely. I wrote this down, and you might want to note this as we think of this thought of patience allowing you to reflect the glory of God. I've recognized something. Impatient people do not reflect the glory of God. They reflect sin and self. Impatient people are not good listeners, and they're not good learners. You ever try to teach an impatient person something? You try to walk them down. I don't have time to listen to instructions. Y'all with me? Impatient people are lousy learners. They're lousy listeners. They're unteachable. They're untrainable. Hey, impatient people get carnal, not spiritual. 
Moses got impatient for the deliverance of the Jews from Egypt. He took it in his own hands and slew an Egyptian. Peter, impatient for the kingdom, went ahead and drew a sword and cut off a, a servant of the high priest's ear. Amen? Impatient people don't get spiritual. They get carnal. And I'll say this. It's sad to see a Christian who's been saved for years act like a child, pitch a fit, quit serving the Lord, react immaturely, get offended about some stupid little thing that isn't worth anything in the light of eternity, and go ahead and, and, and over some little trial, offense, or something that comes along. They pitch a fit, and they react impatiently to some situation. You know the first thing patience will allow you to do? It'll, go to, it'll allow you to reflect the glory of God to an impatient and wicked world out there. Amen? And even Peter says that you, you, get, you, you suffer these, you get, though you get buffeted, you take that patiently. Amen? But the second thing, don't miss this. Impatience allows, patience allows God to do something for you. Not only does patience allow you to reflect the glory of God, but listen to this. Patience allows God to build your faith and your character. Go to 2 Peter with me. Patience allows God to do something for you. He can't do it unless you exercise patience. Patience allows God to build your faith and build your character. Look at what he says in 2 Peter in chapter 3. Look at what he says, or chapter 1. In 2 Peter chapter 1. James, 1 Peter, 2 Peter. Listen to what he says here in 2 Peter chapter 1. Now, verse 3 talks about us being saved, and we've been given life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Now, watch this in verse 5 of 2 Peter 1. Watch this. It says, And beside this, giving all diligence, notice the you is understood. You need to put some effort out here. You need to apply yourself. This isn't something that's going to come through your pillow while you sleep at night, all right? He says this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and do virtue knowledge, and do knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness. Now pause for a moment. He's not saying this. Now that you're saved, add to your faith all of these things. That's not what he's saying. Look at it closely. He says, add to your faith, it's like a chain link, virtue. Amen? Which is clean living. Our, our, our father's a holy father, not an unholy father. We ought to, ought to want to be like him, not like the world. All right? So you add to your faith virtue, clean living. Then you add to virtue. You don't add to your faith. You add to virtue, knowledge, Bible knowledge. Amen? You get Bible knowledge down, then you add to knowledge what? What's the next one? What's that? Temperance, all right? So you add temperance then. Then you add to temperance what? Patience. And then you add to patience what? Godliness. You know what that tells me? Some of you men, maybe with a temper problem, oh, you're looking all cool right now. You all with me? Some of you ladies... Slam the cupboard doors and pitch a fit. Things ain't going your way. Trust me. I know who we are. If you don't get that figured out, you will never be a godly believer. Never. Never. You cannot add godliness until you have patience. This is a big deal. Amen? I'm going to tell you, I know believers that have created that habit of impatience their entire Christian life, and they still think they'll never be godly until they learn to rest in the Lord and to let that spirit of anger and impatience come under the dominion of Jesus Christ. I had to learn that. I'm still learning that. Amen? So patience allows you to reflect the glory of God to a world out there that knows virtually nothing about Him except how we live. Amen? We're often the only Bible an unbeliever will ever read. It's us. But second of all, patience. When you exercise patience in a trial, 
It allows God to build your faith and your character and move you toward godliness, which is God-likeness. Amen? Now watch this. Go back. Second Peter, er, uh, James chapter 1. Watch this. You and I need to recognize that all of this culminates to a perfect work. Look at this in James chapter 1. Let's pick it up in verse 2 so we just catch the flow. He says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Now watch verse 4. But let patience have her perfect work, that she may be perfect and entire, that idea of mature and complete, wanting nothing, that spirit of contentment, just resting in the peace and contentment of your Savior. Notice here, we see the perfect work. Begins with a single word. What's, what's the word? But let. The word let means this. Allow it to take place. Quit always fighting it. It should be a natural thing as a believer. Just, just allow this to happen. Drop your resistance. Drop your pride. Be willing to drop your, your habit. Let this happen. And what is the perfect work that patience produces? I wrote it down. It makes you perfect and entire, which means mature and complete, wanting nothing. In other words, being content. Look at the note. I want you to look at the notes here. This is important. The trial does not perfect you. The trial doesn't perfect you. Your response to the trial is what perfects you. It's patience that does the perfect work, not the trial. Amen? The trial just reveals your faith. The trial just proves you. But when you exercise patience, that is what produces the maturity, the completeness, and the contentment that only Jesus Christ can give. Isn't that good? Yeah, you know, yeah, we always try to, you know, we make so many excuses. You know, Han, I said that to you because yeah, I just had a bad day, you know. It squeezed me, you know. We always blame the trial. Well, the trial just revealed you. That's all that did. The greater the trial, the greater the response patience ought to be. Because th then all of a sudden, you know, the greater the trial and, the, and, and your response to it is even great patience, God gets great glory out of that. Because you can't do that. Only Jesus Christ can do that. Amen? But I guarantee you, if you pause and you look to Him, He's there. That's what grace is all about. Grace isn't the big eraser. It's the power and the desire and the ability that God gives to his children when they come to his throne of grace and ask. Hebrews 4. He gives you a power beyond yourself. He gives you a patience that's beyond you. He gives you contentment that's not yours. Amen? That's what grace is. That's all grace is. That's the resource we have in Jesus Christ. I have this great high priest, Hebrews 4, to you. He's a God who can be touched. He's approachable. Therefore, go to him and ask him for grace to help in time of need. That's exactly what Hebrews 4 says. Yeah. Trial doesn't perfect you. It's your response to the trial that does, and only Jesus can give you that response if you'll cry to him for his strength. Now watch this. Go to Psalm 40. I want you to see something. God, God wants us to grow up in our attitude towards trials and tribulation. Patience is what produces the perfect work. It's patience that produces the perfect work. That's what I wrote in the notes there. Patience is the response of the heart that's focused on the Lord. Watch this in Psalm 40, and a very familiar psalm. This shows us exactly everything I preach tonight. Psalm 40, look with me in verse number 1. The 40th psalm in verse number 1. The psalmist is in a bad way here. He's in circumstances that are, are stretching him and trying him. And look at what he says, Psalm 40, verse 1. He said, I waited. How did he wait? What's the word? Patiently. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. Look at verse 3. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear 
and shall trust in the Lord. Notice here the psalmist is in a pit, but his focus was not the pit. His focus was the Lord. And he focused on him and waited for him to help. And he waited patiently. And guess what? God did something for him. He brought him out of the pit and put him up on a rock and established his goings. And then after that, because he responded patiently, he got to do something for God. He got to sing, and many heard it and saw and trusted in the Lord. He brought glory to the Lord. It all began with a patient response to the trial that he was in. It brought glory to God, and it built his character and his faith. Amen? It wasn't a trial that built him, it was his response. It wasn't the pit that he was in, it was his patience toward the Savior that changed everything. And that's the response God wants. I wish you could have met a dear friend of mine. I want to close with this, that, that was such an example to me. His name is Ron Henderson. I remember the first time I met Ron, I was preaching at a church in Washington, D.C., a pretty good-sized church, big church. Uh, actually, the service finished Sunday night, and the pastor made the announcement that my children would be singing Wednesday night and that Brother Sommerdorf would be preaching Wednesday night. I went up to thank the pastor, and as I stood there milling about with people, a fellow came up to me in a suit and tie. And he went ahead and he shook my hand. He said, Brother Dave, he said, uh, I'm Brother Ron Henderson, and I want to just let you know that I won't be here Wednesday night, and I want to apologize to you in advance for not, not being able to come. The Air Force has me in South Dakota inspecting some missile silos, and so I just want to let you know I won't be here. I want you to know where I'm going to be, and I'm sorry I won't be able to make it, but I'm providentially hindered, and I thanked him, and off he walked. And I turned to the pastor, and I said, who in the world was that? Because I think that was the first time in my entire ministry I ever had somebody apologize because they wouldn't make it to a church service, and it wasn't even my church. Y'all with me? Oh, he said, the pastor said, oh, that's my two-star general, Ron Henderson. He's one of my ushers, and he does that every time. Every time he misses a service, he always tells me where he is. He said, I can tell you any time he's not in church, I can tell you where Ron Henderson's going to be. And over the years, the next few years, as our daughter Kimberly came on staff as a fourth grade teacher, Ron Henderson became just a dear soul, a two-star general, loved the Lord with all his heart, an amazing, amazing story. He's, in fact, he's my front man for the Air Force packages. A few years into our time together, I got the tragic news. Ron Henderson, though he hadn't smoked for over 30-some years, all of a sudden got lung cancer. And Ron began to battle that. As an evangelist, every year coming through, I would get a time-lapse photograph of how Ron was doing. And he began to just literally die before your eyes rapidly. He tried things, different things in Mexico. We had an oncologist in the church there that went ahead and got him treatment. He tried everything. He threw the kitchen sink at it. But it reached a point where he just began to just literally wither away in front of you. He was wearing a brace. Almost half of his ribs were cracked. He began to just literally emaciate, and yet he kept working. Linda would bring him to the Pentagon Monday morning, drop him off. He'd work all day at the Pentagon, and when she came back, he'd just literally fall into the passenger seat, and, and she'd drive him home, and he'd put 50, 60-hour work weeks in at the Pentagon. Three weeks before he died, he paid my family a great honor. He attended Kimberly's wedding. He thought the world of Kimberly, our oldest daughter, and Pierre, whom I call Lucky Pierre. He got my oldest and best. And he, he attended that ceremony, just racked by pain. My dad and mom came in for the wedding, and of course my dad, an old Navy man, seaplanes, he loves the military boys. And so I went ahead and I said, Dad, I want you to meet a friend of mine. And I walked him over I said, Dad, this is Major General Ron Henderson. Oh, Ron, he got to stand up, you know. And they shook hands. I said, Ron, this is my dad, Ron Sommerdorf. He served on seaplanes in the Navy. And I just stepped back and watched those two old boys go ahead and chat. 
Three weeks later, Ron passed away. I remember calling Dad. I said, Dad, I want you to know something. I said, I want you to be one of the first to know Ron Henderson passed away. My dad was never a talker like me. He didn't talk much. But when he said something, it was very, always very profound. And this is what he said. Well, he said, the old general's home. That's what he said. I'll never forget one year before Ron died. I saw him at the church. I said, how you doing on that cancer thing, Ron? Brother Ron, and, well, he wasn't doing good. I could see it. He just perked up. He said, oh, Brother Dave, cancer is my final call. Just big smile. Just excited. I said, what do you mean, Brother Ron? He said, you don't understand, Brother Dave. I work at the Pentagon. I meet people of great high rank, stature all the time. And normally they would never give me one second of their time. But because they know I'm a dying man, he said they honor me and they respect me and they let me tell them how to get saved and make peace with God. In piloting terms, we call flying the jet to splash down. You don't punch out. You fly it all the way to the finish. And Ron did that. Secretary of the Air Force at his funeral. Great man of high stature heard the truth. When Ron got that cancer diagnosis, he didn't go ahead and kick the walls in and get all upset and throw a fit and say, why does God hate me? He just flew that thing, resting in the, in the hand of his God and knowing that God had a purpose for whatever came in his life. And he used it as an opportunity to further the kingdom. I don't know how we'd respond when we got the C report. But I know how Ron did. Just before he died, he said, Brother Dave, you use my story. You get the word out there. He's on my video. He's on the card. He said, if I can make a difference long after I'm gone in the life of those airmen, he said, I'll want to make a difference. Ten years ago, next month, Ron went home to heaven. What a finish. He brought so much glory to God. And boy, he lit up every bit of around him for the Savior. Look at James 1. Follow along, I'll just read it, and we'll close with that. He says this, he says in verse 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. My brothers and sisters, God wants us to, and this world needs us to, grow up in our attitude towards trials and tribulation. You pray for patience, amen? And allow you to reflect the glory of God and allow that patience, that patience allows God then to build your faith and your character. Let's grow up in this area of what comes in our life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for this thought. Lord, we sang it tonight. I'll say yes, Lord, yes. But now, Lord, we've heard the message. And Lord, I would pray for the husbands that are here, the wives that are here. Lord, I would lift up those that maybe even been saved for many, many years. But Lord, they don't respond with patience when a trial comes. They get angry. They get carnal. They become unteachable. They certainly don't bring glory to your name and lift up your son by their reaction to what came in their life. But Lord, beyond that, they just have stopped growing because of a poor attitude towards trials and tribulations. Lord, I pray you'd forgive us where we fail in this area, but Lord, help us as we step out into the proving grounds of life. Help us, Lord, to not only have an attitude of joy, but to respond with patience when the trial comes into our life, that those around us can get a taste of who lives within us, your Son, a patient Savior, a long-suffering Savior. 
that, Father, you can build our faith and build our character as we serve you. Lord, I pray that we'd allow patience to have her perfect work, that we may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads are bowed. I